faced with a sweeping rejection by American voters, Kamala Harris has conceded the presidential election to Donald Trump, encouraging supporters to continue fighting for their vision of the country. The aftermath of this historic American election has left a mixed reaction of voters, some who look back at it with disappointment, and many more who are looking to the future with hope. From the grounds of the White House, Arise International Correspondent Adefemi Akinsoya reports. 300 electoral votes have bought Donald Trump another four years in office, a sweeping victory, and he says the work is far from over. I will not rest until we have delivered the strong, safe, and prosperous America that our children deserve and that you deserve. This will truly be the golden age of America. That's what we have to have. His supporters say they are optimistic for the immediate changes for the better. He's going to lower the prices and make it more affordable for people to have a living and, and put money in the bank. As far as the immigration, we don't know who's in this country. There's people that have been in this country, and I'm sure there's other people that have been in this country 10, 20, 15 years or whatever, that can't get their legal status because the, the system is so bogged down with people that have come across the border and they give them everything. A short distance away at Howard University, Kamala Harris took to the stage at her alma mater to deliver an impassioned concession speech. While I concede this election, I do not concede the fight that fueled this campaign. The fight, the fight for freedom, for opportunity, for fairness, and the dignity of all people. A fight for the ideals at the heart of our nation the ideals that reflect America at our best. That is a fight I will never give up. Despite her defiance, the deflation amongst the students on the campus is undeniable. If I'm being quite frank, I don't feel hopeful. Um, I feel pretty defeated, to say the least. It was very unexpected. I didn't expect it at all. They didn't want to vote for her, so they, they voted for Trump. And I found it very disappointing. I'm very heartbroken. I don't know how long I'll feel this way. I'll honestly probably feel this way for about four years, but who's to say? I think that Vice President Harris has always been the epitome of what someone running for office should look like and what they should represent in our country. And I'm just so grateful that she chose the Mecca, Howard University, to uh, convey this message. Back on the grounds of the president's official residence, preparations are already underway for a new, albeit familiar name. The road to the White House comes with twists and turns, but inevitably there's history on every corner. The next occupant will be Donald Trump. In a presidency, he says, will put America first for the second time. Alifemi Akinsoya, Arise News, Washington, D.C. Joining us now for World Brief and the review of some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is Adefemi Akinsoya. Good morning, Adefemi. Reporting from the city of Trump 2.0. Good morning, Dr. Rubin. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to see you, Rufai. Good to see you, Vimbai. Dr. Rubin, happy birthday. Thank I hope you. you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. November babies. So <laughs> glad to hear that. I hope you're doing great today. Thank Let me you. tell you about what's happening around the world. Yeah. Now, ultimately, we did just watch that report and look and have a snippet of Kamala Harris's concession speech on stage at Howard University. It's definitely not the speech that she wanted to give, but it's the one that she gave all together. Now, what she did do in her speech was discuss the fact that, firstly, she did call and congratulate Donald Trump, which, again, shows uh, good sportsmanship in an election that w seemed to be too close to call in the run-up to it, but one that ended in quite a resounding defeat for her. And clearly, it is quite historic for a number of reasons. We do know that Donald Trump, come January 2025, will be sworn in as the 47th president of the United States. And he, for the first time in his three 
elections has won both the electoral college vote and the popular vote and that is despite two impeachments uh, being a convicted felon being shot as well it's it's definitely a historic comeback and we're seeing that across many papers around the world but before we get into the papers i would like to hear all of your thoughts on kamala harris's concession speech and what you think donald trump's presidency means for the world i mean it showed a lot of grace and this is what we expect of a presidential candidate. This is the dignity in the office of a presidential candidate. But what did we see four years ago? And that's why I find it very difficult, you know, to be able to rationalize Trump. We saw enmity. We saw chaos. We saw a Trump that once the result was announced, started shouting, the elections were stolen, were stolen, were stolen, oh my God. And he continued in that stead up till the 6th of January when he went to incite a mob to invade the capital, to cause destruction and chaos, to decimate what the Americans call the bastion of their democracy. And that's who Trump is. He found it very difficult to be able to reach out across the aisle. He kept on puppeteering the fact that they stole the election. And in truthful, in truthful term, he was the one trying to manipulate the election by calling Rafsenberger, look for the 11,000 votes for me, can I just win Georgia? That's what he did. And we remember that. A presidential candidate calling people in a state to look for 11,000 votes for him. But you can see the grace. And I'm happy Kamala took it well. And that's to show the grace of the lady. A couple of things I learned from the elections. America are not ready for a female president yet. I don't know when they're going to be ready. And largely, the white male privilege is still very strong. In fact, I just posited a scenario. It was not about the economy, no because the economy had recalibrated after COVID at the empirical facts. What's the greatest bell of any economy firming? It's consumption. America consumption was at an all-time high. What really happened and why it was easy for Biden to be able to defeat Trump was a white male privilege. And whatever you say, it still very much exists in America. I'm not sure America is ready for a female president yet. And for the fact that she was female and of color, he did. It did a lot of damage to her campaign because when you look at it, she did everything right. Yeah, she got into the race late, but she did her own. She campaigned so hard. She raised a lot of money. She raised over a billion. She had a formidable campaign. But Americans were not just ready. And it's fine for a generation not just to be ready. In the 80s, America was not ready for a black man being president. If you remember, you know, the likes of, uh, 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 what's his name now, Andrew, Jack, uh, Andrew uh, Jackson or Andrew Young, if, if my memory serves me right, ran for the Democratic primaries in 88, but he didn't get it. I mean, Andrew Jackson, yeah. So he, he didn't get it. Jesse Jackson, beg your pardon, that's the name I was looking for. He didn't get it. But guess what? In 08, exactly 30 years after, America was ready, and they got in the Barack Obama. So America is not ready for a female president yet. That's just it. Trump was able to mobilize his base. Kudos to him and his crew and all of that. But the most important thing about Trump, I should tell him, is now he's president for all. He's president for the Republicans, the Democrats, the Independents, the Greens, and other people that don't believe in him. He's president for the celebrities like Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Republicans that did not endorse him. He's president for Liz Cheney, too. He should be president for all. And like he says... Let us have peace in the world, not the one that you will kowtow to some dictators, not the one that you will send your love letters to Rocket Man down east, not the one that you will partner to Yewa at the back when he continues the destruction and the annihilation of other parts of the Middle East, not the one that you will pass Putin at the back and allow Putin to take more territories in Ukraine when Ukraine is fighting for their own independent statehood. Please, let's have some sanity in the world. Now that you have won Donald Trump, remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's come and gone with, you know, so much pomp and fanfare just like that. Uh, the election is over. And I believe they say that with democracy, uh, minority will have their say, but majority will have their way. The Americans have made their choice uh, and uh, they have spoken 
and this is where the direction that they want their country to go in. Now, this is reminiscent of sort of 1950s protectionism, uh, where you know industrialization, especially European nations, were looking for a push uh, for their for industrialization and to grow their economies. And it seems that the American nation has come to that stage where they are tired of being the world police, where they are tired tired of being uh, sort of the protectors of global free trade, and are now saying saying, you know what, maybe it's time for us to look inward and resolve some of the issues that we have that are niggling issues uh, and focus on ourselves for a change as opposed to e extending all of our resource resources to constantly put out fires around the world. A very welcome development for some and a scary development for others. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out for organizations like NATO. We've spoken about uh, how Donald Trump, of course, in his last tenure and more than likely in this tenure, uh, feels that America is carrying NATO on its back, which it is doing because um, the majority of the member states in NATO are not paying uh, their requisite dues. They don't have the percentage spend on their defense budgets, yet they expect America to still come and save the day. So are uh, member states of NATO going to step up and uh, increase their defense spends? Or are we going to see people, uh, nations falling away from NATO? That's a big conversation to be had. Why is it a big conversation to be had? Because we know that at the core of what's happening in Russia and uh, between Russia and Ukraine is NATO. When we look in history, we see that what happens at the core of a lot of global conflicts is the superpower called NATO with its military might that comes in uh, and, and, and steps in to, you know, to fight wars and uh, to, to fight for whatever side they feel is the just side. So it'll be interesting to experience a four years without that. We can't underestimate the fact that there are so many war veterans and families of war veterans in the United States who are sick and tired of seeing their young men coming home, uh, some dead, some alive, most traumatized, many injured, for wars that many Americans don't even really fully understand. Uh, the toll on that has has been significant. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how some of these dynamics will be shifted because we know that there may not be an extreme shift uh, in uh, American foreign policy concerning what's happening in Gaza, highly unlikely. But it will be interesting to see how this man who has promised that he is going to stop the wars, how he's going to step in and, and try to temper the situation. Because, of course, we do also know that he did get the Arab vote and the Muslim vote, uh, especially in places like Michigan. For us here in Africa, uh, what are the concerns? You know, there's a definitely a very somber mood and people are, uh, are feeling low and pessimistic about what a Trump uh, presidency looks like. Uh, I think the people who uh, should be more worried about what a Trump presidency looks like are those who have sort of hedged all of their bets on the global north. But we've seen generally in Africa, there's a shift towards uh, better relationships with the global south. We saw the out at the BRICS summit. So I think this is an opportunity for Africa to start carving more mutually beneficial relationships with more, uh, with more global superpowers. Uh, you, you know, whether you like it or not, Russia is on the table and Russia is ready to do business. China is on the table. Can we carve out more equitable relationships with China? Uh, and, uh, you know, can we stop looking at a reliance of America to come and save us? And uh, can we get creative about how we handle our our own affairs internally here on the African continent in order to secure uh, a great future for ourselves. And uh, shall I steal that line and say, make Africa great again? That power lies with us, not with Donald Trump, surely not with Kamala Harris either. Okay, a few questions. What does this victory mean for Donald Trump? How did he get there? What are the implications? How did he win? Why? And what went wrong for um, Kamala Harris? And what are we likely to see going forward? Those, in my view, are the key questions on this question of American election. And it's as, it's as follows. When Donald Trump, when he's sworn in in January 2025, uh, uh, will be the oldest man to get into that office. Now, it's been said, this is a historic comeback. It is uh, Trump storming uh, back to White House. This is uh, phenomenal and all of that, because 
contrary to expectations. It wasn't a, you know, a, a difficult election. It won a landslide victory. Among the constituencies that people have thought would not vote for him, blacks, Latinos, even uh, uh, Democrats, he got many Democrats on his side. He proved the Republican skeptics wrong. Those Republican skeptics who said they were on the side of uh, Donald Trump. The last time the president uh, pulled this off was in 1893, when Grover Cleveland, the 22nd and 24th president of the United States, returned. Now you have uh, Trump returning as 45th and 47th president. It's quite a feat. But how did he do it? He was able to appeal to the basic American instinct. It seems to me that this is about the American mind. This is about the American character. Um, uh, 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 Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont, senator, said, look, the Democrats turned their back on the uh, poor people of America. So the poor people of America have also turned their back on the Democrats. What does he mean by this? Trump is uh, an outcast. When the Republicans lost in 2022 in midterm elections, he was blamed. Now, he's a convicted felon. In fact, he's expected in court at the New York Supreme Court on November 26 in the court of Justice Merchant. But uh, that sentencing on all, on, on all those cases in court and, and all, all those will not happen again, now that he would uh, be enjoying immunity very soon. This is a man that preached a message of vengeance and revenge, and yet Americans voted for him. The Americans have decided. What went wrong with Kamala Harris? Well, she joined the race in July, quite late in the day, and uh, on some of the issues about the economy and uh, immigration, uh, she couldn't really you know, uh, convince some of the constituencies. However, I think that the more important factor why she lost is the economy. Now, the Americans are the most uh, distrustful of their economy. Despite the fact that the economy is doing well, inflation has gone down. Uh, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve is going to make a statement today. We expect that they will cut uh, borrowing rates from 4.75 uh, to 5%. Uh, now, the labor market is softening, but the average American still thinks that the Democrats have not done well enough. The expectation is that under Trump, the economy will do much better. Maybe that's why he won. In addition to the fact that there is a, a rise in the hard right, hard wing, right wing politics, not just in the United States, but also all over the world. So yes. Trump wins. Now, finally, what should we expect? Now, Trump's uh, victory has been described as victory for big money. And that's why people like uh, Elon Musk uh, have been dancing, saying that our man is back. The markets went up this morning, did very well. All the three major indexes in the US. Now also, Trump is going to pull America out of the Paris Climate Accord. So oil corporations are going to do well. Uh, the liquefied natural gas exports will go up. He's been talking about energy independence. So he's not interested in climate change, uh, carbon emission policy. So big money is excited. The other thing, of course, is that uh, you are going to find tariffs going up. He has said he will increase trade tariffs between 60% to 100% against, uh, against uh, China. Now, when that happens, that will also require you know, uh, a recalibration right. of, a global, of the global economy. So these are some of the issues that you are likely to see, in addition to the fact that, well, the revenge that he promised, the vengeance that he, he has promised, the enemies within that he says he will fight. We want to see who those enemies within that he will fight will be. However, Kamala Harris has spoken well. She conceded. If Trump had lost, he would not have uh, conceded the race. You know, because he was even threatening before now. So it's not about Trump uh, being graceful. I think Trump just says that he has won. So it is okay if Trump wins. It's not okay if another person wins. But Kamala Harris says the fight is not over. The fight continues. The fight for those values on which she based her campaign: human rights, freedom. You know, the American, uh, uh, you know, uh, dream and possibilities for all. So she told her. Listeners yesterday, not to give up, to look to the future with hope. 
All righty. Well, thank you all for your comments and for your robust analysis. Let's take some look at our papers now. Of course, we'll start with Nigerian papers and the front cover of this day uh, leads as many other Nigerian papers do with the news of the passing of, uh, uh, of Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General uh, Tarid Lagwaja, who has died, unfortunately, after a protracted illness. He is the third Chief of Army Staff in Nigeria to die in active service. Uh, President Tinubu has said and announced that flags will be flown at half staff nationwide for the next seven days to honor the dearly departed. If we look at the Daily Trust now, the Daily Trust, much like many Nigerian papers this morning, is leading on Lagwaja's death. But also the Daily Trust looks at the abduction of 50 people in Zamfara by bandits who have also placed a 150 million naira levy on residents in those areas. This is also as 10 farmers were killed in Niger State. So just to underscore the severity of the security situation, the insecurity in those regions of Nigeria. Moving on to the front page of the New Telegraph now. And the New Telegraph reports that our your state governor, Sheyi Makinde, has approved the payment of 80,000 Naira minimum wage for state workers definitely something that will be welcomed by the people of Oyo and then moving on to the Daily Sun this morning the Daily Sun leads with the Federal Road Safety Court releasing data that shows that nearly 4,000 people have died in road crashes in Nigeria between January and September 2024 alone Moving on to the Daily Independent, and the Daily Independent reports on Zenith Bank assuring its customers of exceptional service delivery after having its systems upgraded. This is, of course, happening against the backdrop of uh, a number of Nigerians facing failing online services across several Nigerian banking apps. Zenith says that all is well. We'll see. Moving on uh, to other papers now, both the Vanguard and the Guardian features Donald Trump's victory. It's definitely something that has permeated into international news and that's, we're seeing that reflected on the front page of the Guardian and the Vanguard, both of them looking at his victory. If we look at the front page of the Guardian specifically, the Guardian says that he is set, of course, to become America's 47th president. And their headline also goes on to say that his re-election comes amid low expectations yet having optimism uh, for Trump's second coming. Very, very interesting times ahead. And then moving on to African papers, they're still running with this theme of uh, Trump's election. Kenya's Daily Nation looks specifically at what Trump's win will mean for Kenya. President William Ruto did, of course, extend his congratulations to Donald Trump, but his congratulations did come a little later than may have been expected. It's something that's picked up in the article in this morning's edition of the Daily Nation, and it will be interesting to see whether or not Donald Trump has noticed. And staying with Trump, uh, in the UK papers now, the UK Independent has called Trump's victory stunning and the greatest comeback in political history. And then finally, the Daily Express, also in the UK, its headline says that Trump has been shot, convicted of crimes, branded a fascist, but he's still the people's choice. And that really ties a ribbon on this election, despite Donald Trump being everything that perhaps people would say a president or a politician should not be. He is all of those things, and he is also president-elect. Talking about some of the African papers, especially what we saw with the Daily Nation of Kenya, it is very interesting to see what type of relationship will be fostered between this new Trump presidency and the African continent. Let us not forget that the last time Trump was in office, he did have some disparaging comments to make about the global south, about African countries. We will not forget that he referred to Nigeria as an s-hole country. And clearly, that is something that still many people in Nigeria, despite the fact that he does have significant support here in the country, haven't forgotten. So it will be very interesting to see what type of relationship he fosters with the international order, but specifically with Africa. Over to you in the studio. I mean, uh, you can see newspapers from all over Africa, you know, having their stab on it. Uh, Kenya, for instance, you remember that recently America and Kenya did have this partnership as regards Haiti. And to pay back the favor, the government of Biden did give uh, a lot of leverage, you know, to Kenya. There was uh, some investment announced by Coca-Cola yes. and a couple of other big American companies out there in Kenya. So 
I mean, what will Trump, what will be Trump's outlook on Kenya? Probably, yes, the U.S. foreign policy will still pretty much remain the same. I mean, when you check both, you know, Democrats and Republicans, they're still mostly the same in most regards. Take, for instance, some things I'll tell you off the bat. America will always support Israel, no matter the government in power. So that one will still always be the same. Right. As regards Africa and Kenya, it's going to be based on what you need from that country. It's going to be based on the needs basis. What is the need for me? Because America is also very transactional. Uh, a lot of people also will say, yes, for the African continent, okay, Trump will be very transactional. Imagine, remember the sale of the Tupac, Tupac Tucano jet, you know, that the Americans are not sold for us for a while you know, because of the Leahy laws and some other, you know, rights problems, human rights problems and all of that. But Trump was very ready to, to transact and open up the vote to be able to do business. Even if you, when you remember the case of uh, Saudi Arabia, the killing of Khashoggi, America that prides itself as a bastion of human rights. But yes, it was still about Istanbul. the deal. Yeah, in Istanbul, Turkey. It was still about the deal for Trump and how, you know, they can consolidate on that. So we're going to see a lot of that. We're going to see a lot of nativism, as it were, uh, we do not know what will happen in the future, so we do not know as regards interest rates. But you know, anytime interest rates climb in America, it's going to have a negative outlook on us here. Uh, because when America sneezes, obviously the world catches cold. And as regards General Lagwaja, I think we had, you know, said our condolences to General Lagwaja all this while. But one other story that didn't make the headline in Nigeria that I'm really very perturbed about is the energy sector. Uh, electricity meters have increased by over 32,000 naira. You are having a lot of increases here and there in electricity, and you're not even seeing the power. Band A now seems to be a curse in this country. And with all of that, the power minister will come out bullishly and state some things that are not true. Just like him saying, oh, over 40% of Nigeria now have access to power, when you only have only 58% of Nigerians on the grid. So I'm wondering what is going on in the power sector. We can't even create electricity. And if we don't create electricity, the grid keeps shutting down almost every time. How can we bring about developments? I rest my case. Right. Uh, I'm going to focus on the Daily Sun uh, with an issue that is quite close to my heart, which is the issue of uh, road safety. Um, so those statistics are, are, are very scary, you know, almost 4,000 people killed on our roads yeah. to um, road traffic accidents in the past nine months, uh, says to over 22,000 injured. And uh, of course, we know as we get into the festive period, these numbers usually spike as everybody gets excitable. Uh, they're saying that uh, the main cause of these road traffic accident deaths is, of course, dangerous driving. However, I think it's also important for us to note the fact that yes. a lot of our roads are not in great condition. And also, if you look at the economic situation, a lot of a lot of vehicles are not well maintained. Uh, you know, people are just getting into their cars right. to be able to transport themselves from point A to point B with the little fuel they can afford at these, you know, crazy fuel prices. Uh, so all of those things are going to contribute. And, you know, just a plea to everybody to just be safe on the roads, uh, you know, drive to arrive alive and uh, you, drunken driving. I know that people take it for granted, but it's a very, very serious issue. And it's an unnecessary Absolutely. and avoidable way uh, to lose one's life. I know in this report that FRSC are saying that they're trying to acquire helicopters uh, as well as air ambulances in preparation for the festive period. Well, I hope they do. I hope they do so. Also, an appeal to those officers of the FRSC to also be responsible in this period, because as much as there's reckless driving and reckless behavior uh, from, from we, the people on the road, on their side as well, We've seen countless, countless videos of what happens when, you know, traffic offenders and law enforcement uh, butt heads. And it also leads to a terrible situation. Yeah. So also just urging for discipline, discipline, discipline from uh, the FRSC officers on our roads uh, as we get to that time of the year where everybody is, ooh, enjoyment, please enjoy responsibly. Okay, very quickly. Uh, I'll, I'll address the question about... What does it mean for Africa? Trump 2.0, what does it mean for us? We look at trade, we look at aid, we look at immigration, we look at security. Now, let me start very quickly with trade. Now, Donald Trump, in the course of the campaign, has said he's going to impose 10% income tariff on all foreign-related goods. It's for China that he has classified 60 to 
100%. What it means is that countries like uh, African countries, like South Africa, for example, that uh, you know, uh, uh, send a lot of exports to the US, they're going to be affected. Because if there is that uh, income tariff, that would be an issue. Number two, also with trade, is Agoa. Now, during its first term, uh, the African Growth and Opportunities Act, this same Donald Trump said that when it expires in 2025, it's not going to be renewed. What does Agoa say? It says that, look, uh, countries like African countries that export to the US will not have to pay tax. That is likely to change, and that will affect trade with Africa. Now, he's going to scale up uh, oil production in the U.S., what he calls energy independence. Now, that is going to have implications for countries like Nigeria that export uh, uh, crude oil to the United States. Now, he has also said that, look, this uh, 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 America, yes, is interested in uh, you know, African countries. After all, during his first time, he, he introduced Prosper Africa, through which some countries uh, benefited. But this time around, that is likely to change. Because the main message of his, uh, of his campaign is about American exceptionalism. He is going to be first and foremost a president for the Americans, not necessarily using touchlights to look for countries that he once referred to as shito countries. That was how he referred to us in Africa. And he dismissed Africa at that time. So that's about trade. Now about immigration. During the course of the campaign, he has said he's going to uh, send away uh, over one million undocumented immigrants. Now, you can be sure those undocumented immigrants will include citizens from Kenya, from Zimbabwe, from Nigeria, whose presidents have been saying, oh, they would like to expand bilateral and economic relations with the uh, uh, United States under Trump uh, 2.0. So that's about immigration. Eight, during his first term, President Trump was saying that he was going to cut aid to Africa. No free money. No uh, unnecessary investments in uh, some of these countries that uh, he described otherwise. So, in other words, I'm saying African countries are not likely, should not be too optimistic. That is going to be like President Biden. President Biden tried to reach out to these African countries to move away from uh, 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 Trump. But Trump is preaching a foreign policy process of isolationism, which is even worse than nativism. Nativism, some people say, oh, he's being nationalistic. But he wants to isolate and draw back. He's not a globalist. And this is a failure for uh, liberal politics. Liberal politics that across the world has become even more illiberal and intolerant you know, against uh, the propositions of FDR Roosevelt, who was a person you know, who was leading this liberal American uh, politics when he was uh, president of the United States. As for security, Africa is also not likely to be a priority for Trump. He's probably more interested in Russia and Ukraine. He's probably more interested in the Middle East. So in other words, what is significant, the whole purpose of this conversation is that Trump presidency has implications for global trade, for global relations, whether it's in the Middle East or it is in, uh, it is, uh, in uh, Europe, but the more important thing is Africa, we should not go beyond ourselves to think that uh, a Trump presidency will consider Africa so important. But we wait to see what Trump does with Agua when it expires in 2025. Thank you very much. Uh, I do feel me at this time.